In this video, we're going to look at ecological niche. Here are two photos that I have taken. These guys both live around my house in Qatar. Let's consider how they both live. The Lilith owl lives in the open desert, hunting live prey such as insects and small lizards. Now the common kestrel also lives in the open desert, hunting live prey such as insects and small lizards. Looking at this, it appears that they share the same way of life. But we know the owl is nocturnal, it feeds at night, while the kestrel is diurnal, feeding during the day. They are separated by time, reducing competition that they could have. This supports Gauss's competitive exclusion principle that states no two organisms can occupy the same niche at the same time. So what is an ecological niche? It could be described as the way of life of a species or population. This would include what it does, where it does it, and when it does it. From this description of an ecological niche, we can clearly see that the kestrel and the owl differ in when they feed, so therefore they do not occupy the same niche. The idea of ecological niche can be developed further. Consider a rocky shore, such as this, or this. We see horizontal bands across these areas. A closer look shows that this is due to the distribution of species. Where I live, this could be drawn like this. If we imagine this is a piece of rocky shore, this is the mean high tide mark, this is the mean low tide mark. Our tidal variation sweeps up and down this approximately twice a day. At the very bottom of this area, we have algae. Above this, we have a zone of many, many mussels. Above this, we have a zone of limpets. And finally, near the top, we have a lot of barnacles. Excuse my bad drawings, this is just an indication. In fact, the barnacles and limpets can often extend well above the mean high tide mark, in what we call the splash zone. It could be argued that these limits are the limits of the niche of the species. So here, these are the limits of the niche of the limpet. Usually the upper limit is due to desiccation or drying out, while the lower limit is due to competition with other species. A long time ago, scientists discovered that if they removed a species, such as picking off all of the mussels, then the range of the species around them expanded. In this case, the limpets were found further down. So the range of the limpets expanded into the vacant area. Now this left biologists with a problem. What was the niche? Was it the original distribution or was it the final distribution? This could be rephrased as where we do find a species or where we can find a species. These have been given names. Where we can find a species is called a fundamental niche, while where we do find a species is called a realized niche. The difference between these is that the fundamental niche is reduced in size by competition. For our seashore example, we can find limpets over quite a wide range, basically from here down to here. However, we do find them in the smaller range here due to competition with the mussels. Biologists have shown some species interactions as is shown here. We can see the larger fundamental niche where a species could be found and a smaller realized niche where they are found. In this case, simplified to only be about moisture and temperature. 
You can see a species can tolerate this temperature, but due to competition, does not do so well. Other species outcompete it here, but at this temperature, it has the advantage. This is where we do find it. And the same goes for moisture. It can live with this much moisture. However, other species do better here and will outcompete it, bringing its realized niche back to this point. In most cases, species interactions are governed by a lot more than just moisture and temperature. This is an oversimplification. However, it is useful to show the differences between fundamental and realized niche.